This is the day that, well, the fast isn't over yet, so I can't say we eat chicken. But this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Is anybody going to rejoice with me? Or am I going to be standing up here by myself rejoicing? Come on, stand to your feet as we sing God Bless America. God bless America.
people lift their voices in your house and praise you. tells us let everything that has breath praise his name so if you're not breathing and you're here this morning you are excluded from this next thing but all of you that are breathing i want you to just say with me praise the lord one more time praise the lord hallelujah turn around right where you are and shake two people's hands greet them in the name of jesus and be seated
Thanks, brother. All right. Good morning, Freedom Center Church. Everybody doing great, right? Amen. I certainly hope everybody's still uh, doing the fast thing, right? Amen. We fit the thing, yeah. That was spiritual. <laughs> We're seeing some, uh, some, having some great testimonies, some great results. And uh, we only got one more week, right? <laughs> but uh, as, a, as a part of that, Elizabeth Pitcher has a ladies class that uh, is doing a uh, exercise program here every Tuesday night. Ladies, if you want to be a part of that, every Tuesday night at 7 o'clock here. Well, actually, I think it's next door, right? Uh, but... That'll be every Tuesday, uh, except when we have, what? Ladies' night out. Girls, what is that thing called? Yeah, girls' night out. Never quite get that. Ladies, girls. Okay. So we're going to have the next one of those. Uh, that'll be not this Tuesday, but next Tuesday, the 29th. All right, girls' night out on the 29th, 6 o'clock for the food and uh, 7 o'clock for the, the real food, the spiritual food. Amen. And also, if you would, uh, or if you think you can sing, maybe. Or... Anyway, we're going to have uh, rehearsals on uh, this Tuesday if you would like to be a part of our illustrious choir. Okay, come this Tuesday and uh, sing. <laughs> also, February is the month of uh, love, right? Yeah. And uh, so we're going to have the uh, Sweethearts Banquet on February 15th, okay, which I think is a Friday, right? Yeah, Friday, Friday the 15th. Sign up in the back for the Sweetheart Banquet. Uh, and also, Aaron, come up for a minute, please. We've got a special announcement, special program here. This Friday is our Friday Night Live if you guys aren't familiar what, with what Friday Night Live is, it's the time where a new generation, we get the high schoolers and middle schoolers together, we have fun, fellowship, and we have free pizza. So if you guys have high schoolers or middle schoolers, you're going to want them to come this Friday. We're also having a special guest rapper. He's a Christian. He rolls with people like KB and Lecrae, if you guys are familiar with him. So it's going to be awesome. He's going to be performing for us. So yeah, get your middle schoolers and high schoolers to come. It's going to be awesome, okay? God bless you guys. All right. So that's this Friday for J-Lo. No, it's J-Flo. We might have J-Lo here too, okay? We'll see about that. She probably needs to come more than J-Flo, right? <laughs> okay. If you are a uh, first or a second time. That one, so because you made that announcement. We've got 12,000 people here on Friday night because of that. <laughs> That's great. If you're a first or a second time visitor to, uh, to our church here, please stand up and uh, we're going to shower you. There, there you go. I knew Bill. All right, Bill. First or second time visitor. Oh, thank you. Here we got a big group over here. Stay standing. Hallelujah. One of the neat things, too, is uh, we have the pleasure to introduce a new member. Mary Taylor. I mean, who can't remember that name? There she is right there, Mary Taylor. Say hi to her. Amen. Good morning. Um, we have been talking about our new program, our new mentoring program called Freedom Friends. And this is the last week if you would like to have a mentor. 
Um, this is the last week to sign up. You can sign up online or you can sign up at the back. Also, mentors and mentees, you must complete your survey that we've sent out and turn that into the office. We have to have that. This week, we're going to be contacting both the mentors and the mentees, and we're going to be sharing with you. We're having a dinner next Sunday night for those that are participating with Greg and I, and uh, we're really excited about it. So complete the surveys. If you want to be a mentee and want to have a mentor, please sign up at the back. Also, this Thursday night, we're kicking off our Young at Hearts um, um, ministry. We're so excited. And um, my mother-in-law and father-in-law have been practicing for this event. So they're going to have an old-fashioned Southern Gospel concert. So please come. Um, we're going to be having a potluck. And I'm sure there's going to be lots of veggies there that evening because a lot of people are doing the Daniel Fast. So please come and bring your potluck, um, and it's going to start at 7 o'clock. So please make sure you also sign up for that. You can sign up online for all of these things, or you can sign up at the back. Okay? Thank you. Oh, one more thing. Growing Kids God's Way. If you haven't signed up, we need to order books. So please make sure you sign up at the back or online for Growing Kids, and that's going to start February the 10th. As y'all know, we have some awesome uh, law enforcement uh, officers that go to this church. Amen. What an awesome job they do. Not only are they are ministers for the Lord as law officers, but they're ministers of the Lord. Amen. As their law officers. And Barry Curtis is one of those. And I'd ask Barry Curtis, they have a special event coming up uh, the 26th, this coming Saturday, at, um, at Lakewood. And uh, Barry's a part of, and I wanted him to announce that to you. Thank you. Good morning, Freedom Church. Church family, my family. Um, as Pastor Greg said, um, we've got some things going in uh, the Houston Police Department. Something that's very unique. It's uh, called Police and Clergy Alliance, PACA. And maybe some of y'all have heard it uh, being announced on uh, KHCB this last week or KH. Uh, or uh, uh, KSBJ. If you haven't, uh, there's going to be some more stuff happening this week. Also, Channel 11 is supposed to do something on it. But uh, just let me tell you a little bit about it real quick. Um, several years back, um, we were tasked with uh, a big crime issue. And uh, our captain at the time said, well, you know, we, we want to know what's, what's going on with the church because the church used to be the center of the community okay for all the different uh, communities out there and people used to the churches used to claim their Jerusalem so to speak around that church and uh, we had all these different crimes that were happening in and around those different uh, church bodies and so we sent out uh, letters to a lot of different uh, churches and and such and uh, during that time uh, I think it was like 300 letters sent out, uh, out in southwest Houston we only had uh, about three people come back and talk to us on the table and so what happened then is we started going out and door knocking and started talking to the pastors individually to find out what's going on and what were they doing. Well, long story short, we ended up finding out that a lot of churches were doing the same thing, but they were doing it, trying to do it by themselves individually. And they were getting burnt out. They were um, drying up um, not only their uh, resources, their uh, human resources, but their uh, their monetary resources and everything, trying to do different ministries inside apartments, uh, inside uh, different crime-ridden areas and, and whatnot. And so we said, well, you know what? Why don't we put something together where everybody combines their resources? And so we came up with this idea, uh, God, God's idea, um, you know, this police and clergy alliance. It, it, it used to be called police and clergy team. You may have heard it called that before, but it's, now it's police and clergy alliance. And, um, and what it is, it's kind of a neutral flagpole, if you will, for all these different church bodies, these, these uh, uh, places of faith, to come together, to work together, to help people. And I'm going to tell you, there's some awesome testimonies. I, I, one day, I'd love to go and, and just tell you the testimonies of the people who have been saved and, and everything from this. It's not a proselytizing organization, but I'm going to tell you, ministry is happening big time in it. And um, also, I know it's been said, uh, Pastor, um, that... that Freedom Center is going to have a big part in, our, in, in not only this area, but I believe in the city of Houston. And because, folks, this is my church home, okay, and you're my family, 
This is where I come to get filled up. And when I come and get filled up, I take it back out there. And right now, I get, a, I get a chance to basically pour out what you feed into me to all these different uh, volunteer pastors from all over the city. Okay, inner city, outer city, you name it. Uh, I'm talking even some of the bigger pastors uh, that are in this city. And uh, God has put me in a unique place. So, having said all that, and I, please forgive me for the time, but we are hosting an event, the Police and Clergy Alliance, that will hopefully just really bring us up another level. And so I ask, first of all, your prayers, because that's the biggest thing. The second thing is, is I want to I see as many folks out there to Lakewood Church as can, can make it. It's just going to be a, uh, about a two-hour event. Well, if you want to come early, there's going to be booths and things. We're going to have our HPD SWAT vehicle out there, uh, helicopter, stuff that kids like to climb on and stuff like that, which is really cool. And we're going to hand out stickers and pens and pencils and different things like that. Um, but there's going to be also some crime prevention info. Uh, our chief of police is coming and he is committing his entire command staff. If you can imagine, this is, this is no small thing for our chief and 14 other chiefs to, and, and, and John can testify to that. You can't get these, you can't get leaders times like this, but they are so excited about this event and being at, at Lakewood Church and everything. He is committing the time and not only that, but 14 of our patrol captains of all, that's a captain for each area in the city of Houston. So the leadership of basically of the, the core leadership of the entire city of Houston is going to be inside Lakewood Church. Now, I, I'd like to say every one of them is a believer, but they're not. But, but we do have a lot of good Christian men and women believers uh, in leadership, and we continue to pray for those folks uh, as they raise up. But folks, how many, let me ask you, how many people live in Houston proper that are in here? How many? Okay, super. All right, so a lot of people are going to be affected directly by this. But you get a chance to ask questions directly to our chief of police. Uh, we're going to have photo ops with the chief. We, we, we're kind of setting him up like the pastor with meet and greet and everything to take pictures, be, pictures with them. Because first of all, we want the public, the general public, to know that we, um, you know, we're the good guys. Okay, we want people to know us like you all know us, okay, on a one-on-one -on -one basis and everything. You know, we're just uh, men and women. Uh, a lot of women, uh, men and women of faith, in fact, in, in the Houston Police Department over my 20 years, I know that uh, we've got a lot of ordained ministers that are actually working as police officers, and they, they are bivocational bi even um, in their ministries. But um, so we want the public to get to know us in, in a great light um, with uh, people knowing that, uh, you know, that we're out there just helping, trying to keep the peace. Do we get, you know, an occasional uh, goof up? Yes, we get a goof up every once in a while, but it's very small. And, um, and so please come out and support us. Next week, if you guys can shoot the camera up on this, okay, it's, uh, you know, 10 to noon, okay, and um, uh, we'll start, doors are open at 9 o'clock. Uh, you know, we'll be staying after until about one. We actually got the venue till about one o'clock, and uh, going to be a lot of giveaways and uh, some stuff out there. So uh, I appreciate it. Thanks for praying for us. And uh, also to go to hpdpaca, P A C dot com, for more information. Uh, I'm going to ask, and, and I know uh, 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 Pastor Tracy is going to talk to some folks. Uh, we would like some uh, uh, men and women to come out of here to ride along with us in our police cars to be out there praying directly for folks when we have tragedies and uh, to plug in the church resources and such as uh, um, we can. The police officer, we want to give all of our police officers a faith-based list so that they can plug into church resources in their area. So this, this is a uni unique opportunity, folks, a very unique opportunity. Hey, Amen. That's uh, warrior in the trenches kind of stuff. Amen. So uh, at the very least, please pray. Amen. Because that's, that's so impactful to our community. Why don't you stand? Let's worship. In the secret, in the quiet place. Stillness, you are there. 
in the secret in the quiet hour i wait only for you because i want to know you more i want to know you i want to hear your voice That I might receive, that I might receive the prize. Pressing onward, pressing onward, pushing every hindrance aside. Out of my way, cause I want to, I want to know you more.
speak together the things that we believe and they are life to us as sure as the air we breathe you're our sustainer without we'd cease to be you are our healer your wounds heal our disease Your grace flow down and touch us. We receive our healing, Lord Jesus. So constant, 
so loving and so true, so powerful in all you do. You fill me, you see me, you know my every move, and you love for me to sing to you. I know, I know that you are for me. I know that you are for me. I know that you will never save me in my weakness. I know that you have come now, even if to light upon my
I know you will never forsake me in my weakness. Let's put a pause right there. If you have a CD player, just pause. I know that you will never leave me or forsake me. You want to talk about a true friend? What's the old saying? A friend in need is a friend indeed. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. When you look around and everybody around you, maybe even your mama, won't talk to you anymore. Your brother has forsaken you and written you off. There is still one. I know you are for me. I know you are for me. I know you never, never, never forsake me in my weakness. I know that you have come now. Okay, hit that pause button again. We got to talk a minute. That line says, even if to ride upon my heart. Does anybody recall scriptures in the Bible where it talks about we will be marked for such a time? That he will mark his own. That we wouldn't be confused and that we would not go to another. That we would know our master's voice. And that he would know us because his mark is upon us. Not to be mistaken for anybody else, but one of his. I know that you are for me. I know that you are for me. I know that you will never save me in my weakness. I know that you have come now, even if to write your name. So we don't forget to remind me of who you are. To remind me, to remind me. To remind me, lest we not forget, Lord, to remind me, Lord, remind us, don't let us forget, let us never forget, to remind me, to remind me of who you are. word says that if he be for us if he is for us <laughs> who can be against us who can be against you nobody nothing nada <laughs> the king of kings and the lord of lords and I know that you are for me I know that you are for me. I know that you will never forsake me in my weakness. I know that you have come now, even if to ride upon my heart. And he has to remind me of who. Father, as we step into where you're wanting to take us today, Lord, we deal with so much in our thoughts and then so much about our beliefs, fighting with belief and doubt and, and faith and fear. Lord, we let external things affect us. We look at things and think, how can this be? And yet it's your word that we must be standing on. 
It's your word. Your word says that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. It's your word that says that. It's your word that says by your stripes. We are healed. That's already in us. It's not something that has to wait to happen. It is in us. These things are already in us. They're already true. That's why if God before us, who can be against us? So, Father, we come to you this morning, Father, through this time of praise, this time of worship. Thank you, Father, for the band and for Don and the worship team, Lord God. And, Lord, where you've taken us to a place, Lord, that we put our trust in you. Our trust is in you. Lord, we lay motives down. We lay thoughts down. We lay agendas down. We lay trials down, adversities down, successes down. None of that, none of that is anything to stand upon but you. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Why don't you be seated? Here, Don. Good morning, Freedom Center. It's time to take up our tithes and offerings this morning. Uh, ushers, if you would come forward, please. Uh, for those of you uh, giving cash offerings, uh, the ushers have envelopes so we can make record of your giving. Uh, please raise your hand and they will get one to you. Um, this time of paying our tithes and offerings is, is an extended time of worship. We are continuing in the flow of worship when we give back God's resources to him for, to do his work. Um, the, 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 tithe, the word tithe simply means 10%. That's all, all it means. And when we, make, when we do that act, we're, we're looking at the very first tithe that was ever recorded in the Bible. That is, Abraham took 10% of the spoils of a battle, and he gave it to the king and high priest of Jerusalem, at the time, Malchizedek. And if, if you haven't studied Malchizedek, I'd encourage you to do that. Where's Doc? Doc and I, he's one of our favorite, guy, favorite uh, individuals in the Bible, is to study Malchizedek. But this act of worship that Abraham did toward Melchizedek, that, that is today Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is our king and high priest. Amen? Amen. Amen. So that, that act of worship that Abraham did, he passed that down to Isaac and Jacob. And that's the tithe we practice today. We don't have the multiple tithes and the multiple offerings. That, that was at the time of Malachi, although the blessings of Malachi still are appropriate for the tithe, the original tithe, we give that individual tithe so God can do that work. So that's the act of worship that we're doing now. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for this opportunity to worship you with the finances that you've entrusted to us, Lord. Lord, we just, uh, I speak a blessing on each individual here, Lord, that the blessings from heaven will overflow upon the giving that, that you've put in each individual's heart here today. And use your resources to further the mission of the Freedom Center, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I have a word for the body here. Um, during praise and worship, uh, the Lord had me to turn to Second Samuel, to First Samuel 22, and He spoke. He's speaking about obedience, and He said, "And Samuel said, have wait for me." And Samuel said, "Have the Lord as great delight in burnt offering and sacrifices as in obeying." the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. And that spoke right to me, but I heard a voice in my heart say, I want you to go forward and give this word because there are many who are disobedient, and God wants you to know it displeases him. And he wants us to walk in obedience. He said, if when you obey him, you're blessed. So, Father, in Jesus' name, I just pray for this, this body here and their families, Father. I pray that obedience to your voice, to your word, to your will will be first in their lives, Lord. Father, that there will be no uh, second thought to obey you, Father. And, Father, I thank you for giving me the courage to obey. Thank you, Father. Whatever he saith, he shall have. Whatever he prays, he shall have. Whatsoever he saith, he shall have. Whatever he prays, he shall have. Whatsoever he saith, he shall have. Whatever he prays, he shall have. Whatsoever he saith. He shall have whatever he prays. I believe, Lord, so I receive. I said I believe, Lord, so I receive. I say to the mountains, be removed, cast down to the sea. I believe, Lord, so I receive. He shall have whatsoever he said. He shall have whatever he prays. He shall have whatsoever he said. He shall have whatever he prays. I believe. No doubting in my heart, I believe. I said I believe. Yes, it's all for your glory. I believe. With faith the size of a mustard seed, anything is a possibility. I will have what I will speak. This is your promise you gave to me.
Amen. You believe his word is true? Amen. When you see scriptures, it says if you pray concerning anything and you believe and you ask in faith, and what's supposed to happen? It's supposed to come, right? But then what happens to us? <laughs> we get a little messed up. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. I said I believe. I believe, Lord, help my, help my unbelief. I believe, Lord, yes, Lord. No doubting in my heart. Promise you gave to me. Yeah. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. 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 <laughs> you see my wife and thank the Lord for godly wives she posts scriptures all over the place I mean you cannot go to the bathroom without scriptures all over the place you open up the cabinet for mouthwash or toothpaste or underarm deodorant and there's scripture all in front of you you look in the mirror to check the blemishes in your face, but there is the word taped to the mirror. Amen. So I'm going into the bathroom and I'm seeing all these scriptures and they're all faith scriptures. Faith scriptures. And I'm seeing that constantly. And I tell you this week as we move into this message this morning that we, we got to get past thinking and past just believing, but walking in the faith of what we believe, unwavering. Doesn't matter about the circumstances, doesn't matter what it looks like, doesn't matter if it seems possible or impossible, but His Word says, it's faith in His Word. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. Yes. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. I said I believe. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. I said I believe. Faith the size of a mustard seed, anything is a possibility. I will have what I will speak. This is your promise you gave to me. I said I believe. I said I believe. Yes, Lord, I believe. Time, yes. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. Amen. That song had to be sung this morning. <laughs> Purple Lincoln, license plate CK2 dash, I think that's a S137. Uh, your horn is stuck. 
<laughs> yeah, it's uh, continuously blowing out there. God is good. Amen. And His Word is true. I hope you're having a wonderful time in your 21 days of pursuing God. That's what it is. Not that we don't pursue Him all the time, but what we're saying is we're, we're, we're not doing business as usual for 21 days. For 21 days, we're shutting it down and we're trying to detox not only our bodies, but our spirit, our brains. That your spirit, your flesh, you know, you want it to be further behind, right? It's lagging back there. So that your spirit is just leading the show <laughs> as you pursue the Lord. Last week we were looking at uh, prayers that fly. Prayers that fly. We want to pray prayers that leave earth. <laughs> they go to the throne. They're heard. We want prayers that, just as in Isaiah 58, prayers that break injustice, prayers that, that get rid of exploitation, prayers that free the oppressed, prayers that cancel debts, prayers that uh, move us to have compassion, follow, that we will we'll have a heart of ministry, sharing our food with the hungry, inviting the homeless into our homes, clothing the cold and the naked, being available for our own families. And we looked at there's two categories of people. There's people that pray and there's people that don't pray. And a lot of people that pray say they pray, but they don't pray. And they'll say, our prayers and thoughts are with you. They're doing more thinking than they're doing praying. The politicians, let's bow for a moment of silence. And that's all they did. <laughs> They sat in silence with no dialogue with God because prayer is dialogue. It's communication with God. Those that don't pray sometimes get converted to prayer when they're flying across the Pacific Ocean and their airliner loses half of its engines. Then they become converted. They pray. They cry out to God. But those who pray, just as in fasting, the manner in which they pray is the determining factor of what they yield from praying. Because if you pray as the hypocrites pray, you're reaping your reward as you're praying. You're getting all you're going to get out of it as you're praying. Oh, Lord. Us, Lord. You know, <laughs> making sure somebody's seeing you. <laughs> somebody's hearing you. Wow, did you hear that cliche? I've never heard that before. Wow. It's not about that. It's not about that at all. Matter of fact, we looked at seven heart issues that clips the wings of prayers and keeps your prayer, prayers from getting off the ground. The first one was self-centered or egocentric prayers. It's all about you. It's where it says, uh, James 4, that you, know, you have not because you ask not, but when you do ask, you ask out of selfish reasons, for selfish, selfish motives. God did not give us access to the throne to go as brats and spoiled children. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about His purposes. He wants mature believers approaching His throne about kingdom things. It's not I dream of genie. You don't rub the Lord's belly and get the answer that you wish. A righteous man prays the prayers of his Father. That's what he prays. And then the second thing was a defiant heart to God's Word. Um, just as uh, the Word that we received a moment ago, to obey is better than sacrifice. If I regard with iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Out of Psalm 66, verse 18. And if you're not willing to do what God says, that, that's already a faith issue. And without faith, you cannot please God. And if you're not willing to obey the Word, you definitely have a, a faith issue because hearing, faith is, comes by hearing, right? Amen. Faith comes by hearing. But we're not to be hearers only. We're to be doers of His Word. Amen. So it, it, He didn't give us all this just to sit and listen to it, and as we're going to look at this morning, to think about it. He gave it to us to set us in motion and set us in action. So a defiant heart to God's Word is an issue. And then the unforgiveness was the other one, number three, which I believe is, sends more prayers crashing to the ground than anything in the church because it's so cloaked with us believing that we're right. We're right, they're wrong. And so we sit in unforgiveness. It's like a stealth plane coming in, and, and it actually neutralizes both of them because typically both of them think they're right. 
And neither one come together and, 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 and reconcile that and realize the issues that we argue about, they are stupid. <laughs> they have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. And then family strife. Family strife. You know the verse, your husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. And it's really hard to be in conflict with your spouse and then turn around, oh Lord, oh Father, and try to get in the spirit. It just doesn't work that way. It doesn't work not only with your spouse, but with your brother or your sister. It says, what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to go get it right with them. Didn't come back to that prayer closet and start praying. Then cluttered conscience from sin, which this kind of pulls from all these areas. But when you have a cluttered conscience, you know, it's, it's pretty hard when you're out carousing around and drinking and doing all this stuff, and then you come to church, and then all of a sudden here's a brother that comes, and he's asking you to pray for him, and he's got a stronghold of alcoholism in his life. Uh... All of a sudden, you get real not so confident in your praying. Cluttered conscience. When you're harboring unforgiveness and you know it, it clutters your conscience. There's things that you must get right. It, it's sitting there. It's eating at you and gets in the way. Doubt, which we'll look at more today. Doubt, which is a lack of confidence. James 1, 5, 8. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let a mask of God who gives to all generously. But we must ask in faith without doubting. Doubt is a prayer killer. Doubt takes away confidence. The opposite of, of belief is doubt. And we said there's nothing better that you know that you know that you know that you know. That you know. You can't change my mind. And then the last one was our hyperbole. <laughs> and prayers that are never prayed. We've called it hyperbole all week long. We've been in fear that I was going to get up here and say, call it hyperbole. But hyperbole. Prayers that are never prayed. You can do more than pray after you've prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Prayers that are never prayed are prayers that are never answered. Prayers that are never prayed are prayers that are never heard. So you must pray. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So today I wanted to look at the anatomy of a kingdom mind. Anatomy of a kingdom mind. Of course, by looking at the anatomy of a kingdom mind... Some of this applies even to a, a lost person. There's some natural things here. But in a kingdom mind, in a kingdom mind, we have thought, we think, we ponder, we meditate. We have belief, things that we believe in, and then faith, the things that we act upon because of our belief. But I want us to look at two different references. I want to start in Matthew 17. Matthew 17, verse 14. And we're also going to look at Mark 9, kind of parallel those two, two areas of Scripture. Matthew 17, 14 through 21 says, When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill. And he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. The disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not, why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, Because of the littleness of your faith. And truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it, will be, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, there's a couple of things. The faith the size of a mustard seed, and I forgot to wear my pin that Debbie Mogab gave me. She gave me a little pin after I got off the platform Sunday. She had an extra one, just happened to have it with her, and it was uh, a little pin with... I don't know how they, they kind of shellacked it or whatever they call that, but it was a, a little mustard seed to wear on your pen. And I left it on my dresser. I'm not used to putting pins on my clothes when I get dressed. I didn't think about it. But uh, I'm going to try to start wearing that to see that. Just It's you know about a sixteenth of an inch, the size of a mustard seed. That stands out to me. But also that when he 
cast out this demon, that it was at once. At once. That really stands out to me. That's what I'm after. I'm after some at onces to happen. The other thing that stands out to me is that nothing will be impossible to you. Jesus already knows nothing's impossible to him. He's trying to get us to figure out that nothing's impossible to us. And then if you look at Mark 9, verse 14. Same account, but a little bit more compassion uh, flair to it because we see a little bit more of the heart of the Father. It says, when they came back to the disciples, and they're coming off of the Mount Transfiguration, it's what just happened, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. And immediately, when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought you my son, possessed with a spirit which makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground and he foams at the mouth and he grinds his teeth and stiffens out. And I told your disciples to cast it out and they could not do it. And he answered them and said, O unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him to me. They brought the boy to him. When he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion and falling to the ground, he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the boy's father cried out and said, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Which is what we were saying a moment ago. I do believe. Help my unbelief. Can you hear the desperateness in a father? There's nothing worse than having your child be the one that's in need. You'd rather it be you. But it's your child. And he's desperate. He's brought him to the disciples and they've been unable to do it. And we're going to look at that in a minute. But he's, he's willing to do anything. I mean, you'll find people who don't believe in miracles. You might have some people from a very conservative persuasion and believe that miracles faded in the first century. But you get their child ill with something and all of a sudden they'll show up at a Benny Hinn meeting. Because you're desperate. You're desperate to see God do something because you have no other choice. You have no other resource but Him. I believe, Lord. Help my unbelief. Verse 25, When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You deaf and mute spirit, I command you, come out of Him and do not enter Him again. After crying out and throwing me into terrible convulsions, it came out. And the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus told him, took him by the hand and raised him, and he got up. When he came into the house, his disciples began questioning him privately. Why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. Now, have you ever found yourself in a situation like this father? I believe, Lord. Help my unbelief. I believe, Lord. Help my unbelief. It's almost like a whirlwind. I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. And then what does it make you do? It makes you go back to this. And I'm holding on to this. Lord, your word says. This is what your word says. I believe. Well, in our thinking process, there's about three areas I want to look at this morning. Which is why we call it the anatomy. We're kind of opening it up. We're kind of breaking it down. But our our thinking process, our thoughts. That's the first area. Belief and faith. But thoughts, it's where we, we can, as a kingdom man, we, I ponder Scripture, I meditate on Scripture, and I think on Scripture. And I take that and, I, Lord, yes, I receive that. I believe that. And then I act upon it. But in our thought processes, we all have the ability. We all think, right? Everybody's thinking. Animals think. 
<laughs> Your dog thinks. Birds think. I, I remember watching the Animal Kingdom one time, or the uh, uh, Discovery Channel, I don't remember which. Two lioness, I guess is what you female lions, lioness. They had tracked down two water buffalo. And they had run them into a mud pit. And in this mud pit, they were buried. Only their backs and their heads were poking out. They were done. They were toast. They were going to die. They were not coming out of that mud pit. They were trapped. And those two lioness were at the edge of that mud pit. And they're kind of going back and forth. And you can see they're just trying to, well, what do we do? 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 You know. And two of them, same species, but two different animals, make two different decisions. One of them gets on his belly, crawls out to one of the water buffalo, puts his mouth behind its neck, shoves its nostril into the mud, suffocates it, and then crawls back out and leaves. And you're looking, wow. It's like it just did a mercy killing. It was the strangest thing. The other one sees him crawl out there, or her, so she crawls out there to the other one and begins to eat it alive. Two different decisions that took place right there in that moment. Thinking processes. You know, so we all think. We all make decisions. Sometimes we make good decisions. Sometimes we make bad decisions. And you can have two people in the same situation do the most extreme things from one another. There was a story about a little boy named Johnny. I read this to the men's, at men's prayer a couple of weeks ago, but Johnny was a little five-year-old boy, real bright little kid, and uh, he wanted a baby brother. So he goes to daddy and says, I, I will do anything for a baby brother. What do I need to do? So his dad, about 35 years old, real bright, says, uh, I'll tell you what, son, you pray real, every day, pray fervently and... and um, in about two months, I bet you'll have a little brother. So the little boy sets out for praying. He prayed hard. He goes on disciplined and fervently for a whole month. But as he's praying, he's going to his friend's house, and his friends are, he's telling his friends what he's doing, and they're like, you're crazy. That's never happened. And, you know, parents are hearing the story, and they're, you know, that's, Johnny, just not how baby brothers come. You know, that's not how it works. And so he's hearing things opposing what he's believing, and he's thinking, and he's just frustrated with it. So he gives up. He goes the next month without praying. He's just frustrated with it. Nah, it's not going to work. It's never happened before. It's not going to happen. And uh, one day, after about two months, mom and dad go to the hospital. Mom and dad come back. They call little Johnny into the bedroom, and laying next to mommy is this bundle. And he walks up, not only does he have one baby brother, he has two baby brothers. And his daddy looks at him and he said, aren't you glad that you prayed? And Johnny says, yeah, but aren't you glad I stopped when I did? <laughs> yeah. Kind of a rigged situation for little Johnny. Daddy already knew something. He already knew. The life was already there. He was putting little Johnny in a little training course of praying something that really has already been answered. And that's how it works for us. See, Daddy is sending us on some missions and he's got things that he's telling us and birthing in us to pray, but guess what? They've already been answered. They're already there. He's wanting us to not give up. He's wanting us, He's training us to not give in to our thought life, to negative reports or, or people that say, well, that just doesn't happen that way. See, there's this natural process of thought that even a lost man experiences. I was thinking about this Friday morning as I was driving to men's prayer. The scripture came to, to my mind that as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. You know, but that's really... That's really not a verse per se for the church. 
That's a, that's a verse for everybody. That's really kind of a natural principle that God put within His creation. Athletes operate on that same principle. You know, you remember the movie Rocky. Apollo Creed is being taped up before the fight. And his coach, you're the best. You're the best. You're going you're to beat this chump. You're the best. I sound like, more like Mr. T as I say it. But, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying. You don't go into a fight thinking you're going to lose. You go into a fight thinking you're going to win. I think one of the worst fights I've ever seen in my life was Larry Holmes and Tex Cobb. Y'all remember that? Tex Cobb. He went in there and got his face pounded for 15 rounds. His face looked like hamburger meat. Larry Holmes is stepping back. He doesn't even want to hit him anymore. And he's having to come in there, okay, boom, you know, backing off. He's so beat, he's not even guarding himself anymore. Of course, Larry Holmes won every round. I don't know that, that Tex Cobb's maybe landed three point punches in 15 rounds. Gets to the end of the fight, and they're interviewing him. And this is what Tex Cobb said. I knew I couldn't win. All I wanted to do was last 15 rounds. That's what he said. And that's exactly what he did. It's exactly what he did. You know, Henry Ford, the inventor of the Model T, said, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. <laughs> I tell that to my kids all the time. If you think you can, or you think you can't, you're right. You're right. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Lance Armstrong could have taken that principle and won all those races without drugs if he understood that. But he cheated it. Businessmen. They understand that. That's what gives them the courage to do the things that they do sometimes and take the chances that they take. That they take. Ask any driven, successful person and they'll tell you, if you want to be something, then look like it. Don't they tell you that? If you want to be something, then look like it. Clothe yourself in it and you'll start looking like it and you'll start thinking like it. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now, this, is, this is a natural principle. You know, man didn't come up with this, and God didn't just give this to Christians. This is a, a natural principle within his creation. It goes all the way back. You look at Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, verse 6. It's a story of the Tower of Babel. And the Lord said in verse 6, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible to them. Come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, so that they'll not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad, and there over the face of the whole earth they stopped building the city. Here was a people so unified... They had unity of communication because there was one language. This is where diversity of language comes from. But God says, look, nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible to them. Nothing that they imagine, nothing that they think, nothing that they purpose to do, nothing that they set their minds to will be impossible to them. But guess what? That was not good. But that was a natural thing within the creation of humanity. God put it there. But because of the fall of man, all of a sudden... Humanity was too messed up to do whatever he thinks. You didn't want a fallen, depraved humanity doing whatever they think. That's why God did what he did. Because he has to come in and get us right. And once he puts his spirit inside of us, now he's got a group of people that can do whatever they think. Because you can be trusted with it. Because you're going to do whatever is within the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And you're going to do whatever is within the obedience of His Word. See, that's why He did that. That's why the end is not too far away. Because there's another tower of Babel. It's called the Internet. <laughs> it's called technology. And it's getting to the same point. Whatever man thinks he can do. God's not going to let the depravity of man do whatever he thinks. He set that in order for the church to do. 
for you. That's why Matthew 21, verse 22, all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. You don't give that power to a carnal man. <laughs> you don't give that power to a Saddam Hussein or a you name it. You don't want depraved humanity having that ability, whatever they ask, that they'll receive. That's for a born-again child of God. That's for the bride of Christ. It's reserved for us. Which moves us to this second area of belief. See, belief is confidence. And it's trust in something. If you trust it, you have confidence. You know, it's like loading a program as you download it off, of your, off the internet on your computer and you're going to install it. And Microsoft doesn't recognize it and it pops up that question. This is not trusted. Are you sure you want to do this? And how many times has that occurred where you go step back and go, wow, wait a minute, I don't know if I have confidence about pressing OK on that. You know, it feels a lot better when it says this is certified. This is OK. We trust this. So when you click OK, you can, you can trust it. It's polar opposite is doubt. The polar opposite of belief is doubt. Here again, we enter into this same cognitive ability that an unbeliever has. An unbeliever can believe in things. An unbeliever experiences doubt. Unbelievers believe in something. Everybody believes in something. Like Bob Dylan, you got to serve somebody. <laughs> Everybody's serving somebody. Because everybody believes in something. James 2.19 says, you believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. <laughs> demons believe. That was the first admittance on earth of who Jesus was when Jesus went into the synagogue in his own hometown. It was a demon-possessed man that stood up in the synagogue and said, what do you have to do with us, son of the living God? <laughs> they knew. They knew who he was. People believe in the craziest things. People believe in the tooth fairy. <laughs> People believe in the Mayan calendar. Hello. Paint your neighbor. You're still here. People believe in the craziest conspiracies. When I get around people that are into conspiracy things, my eyeballs roll back in my forehead. And I write on a piece of paper, I don't care. I don't care. Waste your time believing that if you want to. I don't care. I don't care. But belief can also rem remain in your mind and never be used. Belief can be in your heart, in your mind, and never get utilized. You can believe something and never do anything. You can believe something and never act on it. You can get all excited and shout. To... <laughs> yeah. The band was playing that during rehearsal this morning. I mean, I was, I was dancing because there wasn't hardly anybody in here. <laughs> yeah. That's why I enjoyed the guys doing what they were doing. You might have thought they were being silly, but let me tell you what. Are we not family? I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm silly in my house. I don't know why I have to come here and be religious. Shouldn't be different one place and then the other. I appreciated that, guys. Those are my buddies. <laughs> Faith. Well, that got me rattled. I don't even know where I'm at. <laughs> Belief can be shouted over and triumphantly celebrated within the walls of, four, of a church. And then never carried out the door. Lots of churches doing it. <laughs> Coming in with four walls and getting excited and shouting hallelujah. Singing praises. Giving your tithe. And then walking out. And, and not living out your faith with your own family. 
or with your neighbors. You know, I, I, I've said this before. We have a lot of ideas of what we think the world might look like if it got as bad as some people predict that it would get. And it's been suggested to store up things here in the church. But I can tell you, if it gets that bad, if I can successfully get over here on my bicycle without getting killed, <laughs> those resources will not be here because you'll see government trucks hauling them out. You know, you think they're going to let you keep all that? I don't think so. The church will be in your neighborhood at that point. So have you thought about that? If it really got that bad, as we all think it might, and maybe soon. Do you know your neighbors? Are they born again? Do they love the Lord? Do you even say hello to them? Have you ever done a kind act for them? That very well could wake up one morning and be your church. Your neighborhood. Just think about it. I could be wrong, but you might be wrong too. Hmm. Faith is what shoves you out of the closet. <laughs> I believe this, I believe that, that's all well and good. Here, get out there and walk in it then. If you believe it, live by it. That's to trust and obey. It's to say, this is what I think about this matter. This is what I firmly believe about this matter. This is what I believe to be true about this matter. But now I'm going to step out and I'm going to walk in it because this is what I believe. That leads you, you're in faith now. <laughs> you're in faith now. Because, see, the polar opposite of faith is fear. See, you don't live in fear for thinking something. You can think and believe all you want to. And you can keep that all hidden in your brain. And you won't have to worry about fear at all. The only battle you won't have to fight is doubt. As you talk to yourself. Or you hear somebody else say something and then you talk to yourself. And you'll contemplate, well, is that right? Is that wrong? Mm -hmm. I don't know. But no fear will enter into that situation until you step out in what you believe and start acting on it. And maybe even suffer persecution for what you believe. Or look foolish. Or seem crazy. Going into that hospital. And all these nurses and doctors running around. And people giving bad reports. And you go and you lay hands on there. And you pray a prayer of faith anyway. Stepping out on it. That's why the opposite of faith is fear. Not doubt. It's fear. Faith without works is dead. Faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. This, be ye a doer of the word and not a hearer only. In other words, the word of God is not intended to be heard, but to be acted upon. That's what it's intended to be. You must hear it, think on it, believe it, and then step out in it. That, my friend, is faith. Faith requires that you do something with what you believe. You may doubt something that you believe, but there's no fear in that if you just think about it. But if you experience fear in the face of faith, that's because you've been required to do something. But faith can override doubt when you're willing to step out. How many times when you've stepped out on faith, even when you looked foolish, and after you've been obedient to what you were told to do, you walk away from it and you're thinking, you just feel right. doesn't matter if somebody's saying, well, that's a lunatic over there. No, just a fool for Jesus and willing to be one. So I'd rather be a fool for Jesus than a fool for anybody else. Matthew 14, 22 through 23, Peter walks on the water. Peter's walking on water. We know this story. It's a popular story. It's even a, it's even a snide remark that you hear even in the world. I remember growing up as a, you know, playing in bars and stuff. And if you kind of got holier than thou, they said, well, 
Why, you think you walk on water? You know, it's just an expression. But Peter, here he is, walking on water. You know what went wrong for Peter? This is the progression. The first thing that Peter did was not doubt. The first thing that Peter did was think. See, when he got out of the boat, he didn't think. <laughs> there was no thought process, and it was just, Jesus, heading towards him. And then all of a sudden, wait, I'm not supposed to be here. He starts thinking. And then out of his thinking, he starts doubting. And then bloop, 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 bloop. Yeah, sinking. <laughs> thinking, thinking. Instead of thinking, thinking, right? He's saying, what am I doing out here? How can I do this? How many times do we do that? We, we get in a situation and we start thinking, and start doubting, rather than just believing and acting on it. It might do better if you quit thinking so much and just start believing. Jesus said, oh, ye of little faith. He said it even to Peter at that point. Here he's accomplished walking on the water for a little bit. He's the only human that did it. <laughs> and he says, oh, ye of little faith. Why did you doubt? You had it going on, buddy. You were doing it. Why did you start doubting? Which gets us back to our text that we started with. You might be wondering why we read that. Mark 9. This father bringing his demoniac son and the disciples couldn't get the job done and I want to take a look at that for just a minute I've tried to figure out how we do this but I want you will I'm going to just kind of talk you through some things and as I do this I want you to imagine what I'm talking you through is like a movie line no movie is any good without music, right? I mean, can you imagine sitting through Jaws without music? It's no big deal. You better be looking, brother. And then it's getting a little faster. The music tells you everything. You can close your eyes and you know what's happening. And in any movie, think of a storyline that you've got. Something starts with a bit of a challenge and then they overcome the challenge and things are wonderful for a season of time. And so now the music is, ah, and violins, it's all wonderful. And everything is going great, and you're seeing all these great things happening. Just think of it in the storyline of Jesus. Jesus and what he was birthed in. He had these challenges that he was born into as a human, lived for 30 years as a human. But then as, as, as a man, just a normal man, a carpenter, and then he goes into the wilderness, and he fasts for 40 days, and then he's tempted and then he's baptized. And then he begins this powerful ministry. And all the disciples, he selects them. And they're like, ah, this is awesome. You know, They're all excited. And they're traveling with Jesus. And they're seeing miracles. And the music is just wonderful. Ooh, it's all great. Until about Matthew 16. And all of a sudden, there's some dissonance that starts coming into the music, right? And the melody begins to get a little more eerie. That's when you're sitting in a movie and you realize, oh, something's about to happen. You don't even have to know. You're not been given. The music is foreshadow of what's about to occur. I just want you to think about this. See, the disciples, the disciples had had demons subject to them. They were sent out with power and authority. They have already been casting out demons. It says in Matthew 10 that they cast out every kind of sickness and every kind of disease. There wasn't anything that they challenged when they were sent out that they were not able to cast out and have authority over. Nothing. So what went wrong in Mark 9? Jesus made it clear. It was unbelief. But where did it come from? Now I want you to put this in context as we have the beautiful music going. 
Okay, all the beautiful music. Life is good. You're watching a movie and they're just fast forwarding you through a period of time where everything's great and you're seeing one scene after another scene after another scene after another scene before the dissonance comes. But they've seen leopards cured. He's healed many, many who are sick. He heals a paralytic. He delivers demon-possessed people. They see all of this. They're a witness to this. They've participated in this. They raise people from the... I've seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. Will that not make a believer out of you? He's already in the tomb. And he smells like death. There's a stench. And he rolls away. This, Lazarus, come forth. They've already witnessed that. There was a little girl that Jesus raised from the dead. Healed the woman with the blood issue. Restored sight to the blind. Watched him spit in mud. Put it in a person's blind eye. Said, go watch in the River Jordan and you're going to see. That didn't even make sense. Go put some dirt in your eye. See how that works out for you. <laughs> Fed 5,000 with five loaves of bread and two fish. Walks on water. Many sick people who just would come and touch him would get healed. Multiple occasions, he healed the lame, the blind, the mute, the maimed, and many others. He fed, and on another occasion, 4,000 with seven loaves of bread and a few little fish. The disciples were witnesses and participants to all of these incredible events, all of these incredible miracles. Peter had just received a revelation from, straight from the Father, a divine revelation. Peter, who do men say that I am? Well, they say that you're a great teacher. They say you're a prophet. Oh, really? Well, who do you say I am? You're the Son of the living God. Son of the living God. This is, this is edging up right up to this point that we're looking at in Mark 9. But then right before that, Peter quickly gets rebuked. Jesus begins to unfail his purpose of being on earth. And it's not matching up to what the disciples thought. See in Matthew 16, verse 21. Matthew 16, verse 21. says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. This is where he began to let them know. And they weren't getting it. And matter of fact, when he shared this, all of a sudden Peter jumps up to correct Jesus. Uh-uh. No, this can't be. Shh. They're going to think you're crazy. Jesus says to Peter, who just had a divine revelation, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> you don't understand what I've come to do. None of them did. What we find is a group of disciples where all of a sudden the music has changed. And they don't understand what's going on. They thought that he was coming to set up his kingdom. You see him even arguing on the Passover the, before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, arguing, oh, who's the greatest? Who's going to be sitting next to you? Blah, 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 blah. It's all about ambition and it's about uh, their stature and, and who's closest with them. And, and they're thinking he's going to rule and reign. Wow, we're in, man. <laughs> we're the closest ones. We're privileged. Wow. But everything they thought concerning the Messiah was wrong. They'd hear him talk about his death. And he, he mentioned it several times after that point in Matthew 16. He always mentioned with his death, his resurrection. But even some commentators believe that they weren't getting it. You know how you, so you can tell somebody a thousand times and they ain't getting it? Because they're so caught up with what they think that they cannot hear what you're actually saying. They're, it's like filters. They're, they're hearing the truth coming at them and it's hitting filters and it's being adjusted to what they think, what their preconceived ideals are, or what their motives are, or what their ambition is. And that's what's happening. They're thinking, yes, we know there is a resurrection, but no, you're not dying. You're supposed to set up the kingdom. You're supposed to rule and reign. You're the king of kings and the lord of lords. Well, we fight the same fight today. The very same fight. Because we've been given all authority 
and all power. And the reason why he gave us all power and all authority is so that we might serve his kingdom. And that nothing is impossible to us. Nothing. So that when we pray for something, it happens. It's not to prop up a ministry. It's not to even build this church. It's so that his kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. It's all about him. It's all about him. And we look at circumstances and we pray and we pray and we go through thought processes. And Lord, how come you haven't answered this? And this looks so bad. And we think and when our belief wavers, toggles between belief and unbelief. And we find ourselves messed up. Lord, this isn't how it's supposed to be. We find ourselves at a crossroad of doubt or belief. You know, Jesus didn't release those disciples with partial authority. When he said, you go out, I'm pairing you up and I'm sending you out. Cast out demons, heal the sick. I'm not, he didn't send them out with partial authority. Now, guys, be careful because you're going to run into a few challenges out there. There's going to be some certain kind of demons that you're going to run across. You're just not going to have any power over. Um, you're just not there yet. And no. And it's not true for us either. He's given us all power and all authority. But these disciples in Mark 9 despite all that they witnessed and all that they saw. Because things were not working out the way it was supposed to and the way they thought and the way they had imagined. They've lost their confidence. They've had a meltdown. Matter of fact, from that point on, you see a meltdown of the disciples. What happens to Peter just a little bit later? He denies Jesus three times. They wind up huddled up and afraid because he's been crucified. He's dead. They still are not getting it. It's not working out the way they thought it was supposed to. That's why Judas Iscariot would have been willing to betray Jesus because it was not working out the way it was supposed to. He's, he's, he's been in charge of all this money and he's hanging around this guy that all of a sudden he's talking about dying. No. So he goes and makes a deal. Gets out. They're on the run until the day of the resurrection. And in that time period before Jesus ascended to His Father, that time of Jesus showing Himself and proving Himself, even in that, the Great Commission, we were talking about this morning, even at that, when He gave the Great Commission, it says that, and some doubted. Some even still. But then what did he tell them to do? I want you to go to Jerusalem and I want you to wait. And I think what's neat, what kind of hit me this week that's special about that, because they've been on a ride. It didn't work out the way it was supposed to. It looked like it all fell apart. Now Jesus did exactly what He said He was going to do. He has risen from the grave. Now He's ascended to the right hand of the Father and He's sending His Holy Spirit to come inside of us and to empower us. So He said, go to Jerusalem. So let's go do it. So why are they there? Most people would say from our charismatic background to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. No. They're there for one simple reason. He said to do it. <laughs> he said to do it. You see, they've been reduced to a place. They have no options, no agenda, no motives. It's all been stripped away. Jesus has done everything that he said. It didn't look like, well, we don't know, but you know what? He said the next move is we go to Jerusalem, so we better go. <laughs> we better get there. And then you know the rest of the story. His Holy Spirit pouring out on them. He, he moved those disciples to the same place that we're at today. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. He's kind of shifted them into another phase. I want you to go to Jerusalem. They don't know what's coming next. 
They have no idea what's fixing to unfold. They've just been told to go and do it. And that's how we're living today. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. We're going to believe even for things that we've not seen. Which made me think of a story. <laughs> Bear with me just for a few minutes. I was my first church I was full staff, full-time staff at was uh, in Iola, Texas. I'll ask again, is anybody ever from Iola, Texas? No? College Station, College Station so you know. But that's okay. You're not from Iola. Okay. I'm not going to say anything bad about Iola. <laughs> Wild little town. It's one of those places uh, where if you're not fourth or fifth generation, it's kind of hard to get in. <laughs> you know, people have been there a long time. And God did miraculous things while I was there. I was only supposed to be there for three months. I was there for about two and a half years, I believe it was. And uh, that first summer, we had 21 kids get saved. And, and, and through the youth. It's just phenomenal. But it's a peculiar thing. There's a lot of country folk out there. And a lot of country folk who got a little bit of money. You know why? Because they've been there for generation upon generation and they have all that property. Some of them you know, cattle and ranchers. A lot of them, uh, you know, farm. and They got the mineral rights to that land. And somewhere in the late 70s, early 80s, they, they found oil on a lot of those people's property. And I just thought about that. Here's these people who've lived there for generations in their feet, walking on that ground. And just below their feet is a resource that can help them, can cancel their debt, <laughs> help them get things that they've wanted <laughs> right underneath their feet and they never knew it. Never knew it was there till it got tapped into. But Jesus is living inside of us. And everything that we need is in Him. And if everything that we need is in Him, then everything that we need is in us. And this has been a bit of a revelation for me because it's about His Word. He's good for His Word. You know, that's real important to me. I try to teach my kids that. I get aggravated. I, I mean, I'm, I do get aggravated if they tell me they're going to do something and it doesn't happen. That's very frustrating to me because your Word, God's Word, can be counted on. And when he says, by your stripes, by, by his stripes, you are healed. That is truth. You can believe it. You can count on it. And what he's saying, what I did on Calvary, what I did on that cross has already been provided. It's like little Johnny. The answer has already been given. It's already been provided. It's inside of you, waiting for you to believe. Healing. We're not confessing fantasy. We're not confessing fantasy. Healing is already in us. We just have to come to the realization and tap into it. We've got to move past what we think, even past some of what we believe, <laughs> and just start acting on it. No matter what it looks like. We may appear foolish, but you'll never go wrong erring in believing. You will never go wrong erring in believing. If you're going to make a mistake, if you're going to do something wrong, do it believing. <laughs> Quit thinking about what it looks like, how bad it is. Start believing enough to step out on it with faith and confidence. Marlene Monday sent me this little prayer. It's called the knot prayer. Dear God, please untie the knots that are in my mind, my heart, and my life. Remove the have-nots and the cannots and the do-nots. Erase the will-nots and the may-nots and the might-nots that they might find a home in my heart. Release me from the could-nots 
would not and should not to obstruct my life. And most of all, dear Lord, I ask that you remove from my mind, the heart, and from my life, all of the am nots that I have followed, to, allowed to hold me back, especially the thought that I'm not good enough. Man. Everybody stand. First of all, if there's someone here today that doesn't know Jesus, you don't know him. You don't have a personal relationship with him. I'm going to be here for quite a while today. I would love to talk to you, Tracy, Clarence. If you'll catch them after the service, who you're comfortable with. One of the elders would love to talk to you about receiving Jesus. It's, it's not a complicated thing. He's real. He is who he says that he is. I believe that. And I'd be more than willing to pray with you about that. But secondly, there's people here that need healing. There's people here that have some needs. Not just physical, but spiritual things going on. And if you are one of those, I want to want to pray for you in just a minute. We're going to line up here in just a minute. But I just, this was another revelation thing for me. Guys, we've got to move where it's not about symptoms. I was reading a book by uh, Paul Bilheimer. And he was terminally ill with tuberculosis. He, uh, he was born in 1898. He grew up in a ministry. His dad was a preacher. He started preaching at age 16 full time. And World War I happened. He got caught up in that. They sent him to officer school. When he came back, he had ambition and different ideas. just like the disciples. And then a sickness came on him. Tuberculosis. To the point that they said he has really just days or weeks left. And he's, he made a pact with God. He just cried out to God and said, God, I know I'm supposed to be preaching. And if you'll restore my health, I'm going to preach. That's what I'm going to do. And the Lord brought healing to him. And it, he immediately started feeling better, but it, it did take course of weeks of strength coming back and his lungs being restored where he could walk long distances and, and uh, he went to a revival and because he was in the ministry and his dad was in the ministry, this evangelist knew who he was and he said, Paul, I want you to preach Saturday night. And Paul sat there thinking, boy, if I, if I don't, I don't want the sickness to come back on me. <laughs> but if I do, I don't know if my body can even handle it to preach for an hour or preach for whatever time that it takes. I don't know if I can do it, if I can endure it. But he said yes. He went and he preached. He said, before I even knew it, an hour had passed and he was preaching with fervor and laying it out there. And when the service was over, he felt great. And he went home that Sunday morning. He felt good enough to go to church. And he's at church and he's testifying about how I know that I'm healed. He's talking about all these good symptoms going on in his body and how I know that I've been healed. And then he goes home that night and all of a sudden, bam, the worst, most intense things hit his body and he goes through about a 48 to 72 period of struggling for his life again and it hit him he realized Lord I repent you know what he realized I was putting my faith in the symptoms <laughs> I was putting my faith in feeling good I was feeling better so I was rejoicing but the truth is that healing has always been in me and so my faith must be in the Word, regardless of the symptoms or regardless of how I'm feeling, if I'm feeling worse or if I'm feeling better. It is the fact that He said, by His stripes, I am healed. It's His Word. It's what He says. We've just got to move past our thinking and even some of our believing Drop it off and just start walking in faith to what he says. And one thing he's told us to do is pray for the sick. And we're going to do that. I would ask if you need prayer this morning, if you'd line up here, anybody who needs prayer, you have something that you need healing from, amen? Anybody? Amen.
as they come, just sing that a little bit. I know that you are for me. I know that you are for me. I know that you will never forsake me and my weakness. I know that you have come now, even if to write on my heart to remind me of who you are, who you are. with me one more time I know that you are for me I know that you are for me I know that you will never forsake me in my weakness I know that you have come now even if to write upon my heart Remind me of who you are. You are our healer. You are our deliverer. Your word says that you came to set the captive free. You came to cancel our debts. <laughs> Deliver us from our thinking, Lord God. Help us, Father, to be people of faith that believe that your word says what it says and so we believe it and we're acting on it we're going to live that way kingdom living it's how we want to live kingdom living to live as Jesus lived I see what my father is doing I hear you father and go and do that pray over that walk in that to have no other agendas no preconceived ideas not trying to fit things into our mold but what you say. Help us, oh God. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. <laughs> I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. Move us into deeper places, Father, of trusting and obeying your word, I pray. I'd ask right now, if, um, Clarence and Tracy, if y'all would come, and uh, elders, if you would come. We want to pray for these that have come forward. And I would ask just for a moment, if you would just tarry for a moment if you can, and just worship with us, pray with us. This is not, you know, separated from you. <laughs> so just sing that. I know that you're for me. You see. 